Welcome everybody. I'd like, to, I'd like to welcome you here to your classroom for some of you and to, to those of you who are on Zoom. I'm Heather Nickel. I'm the director of the uh, Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies. And we are the uh, organization that is sponsoring the North of Trent lecture series, which um, is bringing you tonight your guest, guest speaker, along with a little help from <laughs> Erica and Graham and, uh, uh, and you yourselves. So uh, just by way of introduction, this is the first of two North at Trent lecture series that we'll conduct over the next um, two months. The North's been a, uh, long been a subject of discussion at Trent University and students and faculty at Trent have examined the North in its myriad contexts. The North at Trent Lecture Series began in 2011 as a way to connect the Trent community with current research being done here and elsewhere. The Frost Center that I represent is pleased to work with our colleagues to bring a scientific focus to this year's lecture series. Now, you may be aware that we had over the years since 2011, we've had a number of lectures, lecture series, and for the most part, we focus on different topics, sometimes cultural, sometimes you know, things like film, sometimes policy, all kinds of different themes. But it's been a while since we've really had a good scientific focus and an ecological focus to the theme of our talks. So thank you, Eric and Graham, for making space in your class curriculum, and especially to Erica for your help in connecting us with Dr. Gilchrist, um, who joins us tonight, and then Dr. Preventure, who will join us on March 4th for the second of the lecture series. So Erica, I'm going to turn the, uh, the mic, <laughs> the little box over to you and I'll let you introduce um, our guest speaker. But again, thank you for inviting to be involved. Maybe I'll just hold it. Um, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you and I'm teaching after the reading break. So I will see you a lot. And I think many of you I probably had in the first year biology course as well. I see lots of people nodding their heads. So anyway, it's my uh, delight to be able to introduce Dr. Gilchrist to you today. Uh, Grant, because I'm going to call him Grant because he's a close friend. Um, Grant was actually a trend undergrad in the early 90s. And he was one of my first honor students. And he, um, he was really, really set on becoming a high school teacher when he came to Trent. And then we started talking, he, he had multiple interests and most importantly, he was a climber, a rock climber. And so I thought, ah, I have a colleague who studies seabirds in the Arctic and maybe you'd like to do an honor thesis because he, was, he expressed interest in doing an honor thesis. And so we sent him up to Coates Island, which is the far Northern end of Hudson Bay. And that began his life in the North. And in fact, he stayed there. I mean, he has continued to work there for the last 30 years. And mostly uh, in that time, he did graduate degrees in different places, but I actually PhD at UBC, um, also with my former supervisor. So, but he, um, he has been a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada since that time. And he's done all sorts of very interesting things in the field of marine birds. But Lately, he's also, just so I can read these, actually done some really interesting things in terms of engaging Inuit in terms of science and STEM. So he started, a co-started an Inuit field training program, um, increasing the cap capacity for environmental monitoring among Inuit, which are the Northern people. Uh, he worked on a federal working group to enhance Inuit participation in science. And he's worked in a marine working group uh, doing marine spatial planning in all the waters in the north. And then most recently, he was a chair of the NSTP uh, program, which is the Northern Scientific Training Program that many undergraduates at Trent actually get funding for to go work in the north and do research. And that is an opportunity when you start to enter and think about fourth year projects that you should consider applying to that program. And so Grant was chair and got to evaluate a lot of Trent applications during that time. So, and it, I will turn it over to him to explain much of the science that he has been doing and lots of other fun things, I'm sure. And I just want to say that Grant is a fantastic um, speaker and colleague and has all sorts of talents. And afterwards, you should ask him if there are any jobs up north too. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, everybody. Can everyone hear me? First lecture with a mask, so I'm going to get used to this. But um, as Erica mentioned, I was an undergraduate student. I took this course about 35 years ago. I was here to be a high school teacher, and while at Trent, I took biology, biochemistry, but I also had an opportunity to take courses in art history. And a lot of courses that interest me were Indigenous studies. It was called the Northern and Native Studies Department at the time. But you're going to see some of those themes running through my research program. Um, I'm going to be talking about science, but I also want you to consider the creativity of science and also the linkages with Indigenous, particularly Inuit, I've worked with uh, my entire career. But before I talk about science, I want to talk about art. So I took an art history course here, and I had a, a, a while a student, and before coming to Trent, I had an interest in the Canadian wilderness and canoe tripping. And let's just get the slides to advance. Um, I don't know if anyone else cannot see Grant. Or I, I'm just seeing a shared background uh, from Graham Rabbi. Yeah, there we go. Yes, yeah, so for those on Zoom, <clears throat> you'll just be seeing my slides, which is not a bad thing. You can turn on the thing if you want, but it doesn't seem like it up your Yeah. So I, uh, this is Georgian Bay, Ontario, and I was uh, canoe tripping. I had an opportunity to work um, in Algonquin Park when I was 16. And um, while in the art history course, <clears throat> I wanted to do a project, an essay on the group of seven who were, as you know, the Canadian artists who explored Algoma country and Georgian Bay. And as part of my essay on one of the artists, A.J. Casson, I actually learned that he was still alive and living in Toronto, he was 92. Now this was before Google and the internet. So I actually wanted to meet with him and interview him. So I went to the battle library and got a telephone book and looked him up. And then I got his number and went to my room, a landline, no cell phones, and had the courage to phone him. And I actually got his daughter on the phone and I expressed an interest to come meet with him. And I did, I drove to Toronto and um, met with, whoops, let me just skip, sorry. I'll just click here, yeah. Yeah, so I met with AJ Casson. <clears throat> I visited him in his house, in his beautiful house, surrounded with a group of seven, Emily Carr, all original work, none of which I'd seen because it hadn't been published. And the two of us sat down and had a cup of tea together. So it was really an amazing experience. And um, I'm just trying to, I'm used to, um, there we go. So we had a chat and he knew that I was a scientist with an interest in art. And he said, and so we're talking about the group of seven. He was a young man and the courage it took to break out of the mold and do some interesting things. So he said, okay, you're sound like a bright young guy. Um, your challenge is what are you going to do and create? In my case, it's paintings in terms of science. It might be individual outcomes and in our case, scientific papers. But then the issue is, with those paintings and with those pieces of science, what are you going to achieve with it? So if you just take them one at a time, they don't amount to much. If you take my career one painting at a time, it actually doesn't amount to much, but to collectively, it's, you're working towards a body of work. And if you're good enough, and if you're trying to be innovative, whether in art or science, which takes creativity, you have to start thinking, what are you going to do with it? And what are you going to change? Now the group of seven changed perspectives on Canadian landscape. And at first they were ridiculed, which is also one of the benefits of being a group rather than an individual artist or an individual scientist. So when you consider this talk, like many scientists, we're gonna emphasize the team um, and the different elements and expertise that are brought to science groups because no one can be an expert in everything. And as a government of Canada research scientist, my job description is to conserve marine birds and marine ecosystems in the Canadian Arctic. Now to do that, I have to attract geneticists, demographic population modelers, Inuit leaders, the CEOs of mining companies, ships captains, air pilots, lab and physiologists, and 
So that is an interesting conversation with an artist that I actually took with me through my scientific career. And you think, well, what does this have to do with science? Well, it actually has to do with everything with science because science is, as a body of knowledge, is trying to um, be rigorous and defensible and in conservation biology and the types of things I work with, conserving birds, making sure populations are sustained. Um, it takes innovative team building and creativity, especially now. With climate change, you know, when I was a student at Trent, there was no climate change in the discourse of, of school. Now, it was, on, it was actually ongoing, but we didn't know about it. We weren't learning about it, and that came later. And when, as it started to gain momentum, scientists like myself were actually ridiculed and persecuted on social media, um, much as nurses and medical doctors are being ridiculed for vaccine issues at the moment. But it's gaining momentum. And when I first went to the Arctic, and one of the reasons I went to Trent was its northern focus. I went to the Arctic with a vision of it being pristine and true wilderness, and in a sense, to get away from it all. But in fact, none of it is a very busy place. This is a schematic of mining leases, shipping routes, aviation routes, protected areas. It's really a complex place at the interface between industry, climate change, indigenous culture, and um, just the societal pressure. It's almost like a microcosm of everything that's facing the planet. And being a research scientist with Environment Canada, we're literally on the front lines of this. This is one of our field sites, and I've had the pleasure of working with Erica in northern Hudson Bay. And this just gives you a sense that when you're flying above, it looks pristine, but every inch of none of it is accounted for, either through an Indigenous land claim agreement, a mining lease, or, or things like that. So today I'm going to discuss and focus in on the conservation biology of one of the species I work with, the northern common eider duck. And it reflects a collaboration with the Greenland Institute of Nature, the uh, university in Denmark, Aarhus University Environment Canada, and a number of other collaborators, which I'm gonna have the pleasure of introducing you to. And through the talk, I'm gonna also emphasize the contribution of graduate students. So I'm gonna introduce you to the people who've contributed elements and pieces of the puzzle. First, some early lessons. I got my first job in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. I was in my twenties. I uh, was keen, but didn't know much, fresh out of school. And in my office, I got a phone call out of the blue from an Inuit leader in Santa Kilowack, Nunavut, a place I knew nothing about. I actually, while on the phone, I had to look at my map of Nunavut to see where this was. And Lucasi Aratanga contacted me because he tracked me down as a seabird biologist to say that the eider population in their island archipelago in Hudson Bay had declined dramatically, like 85, 90% population collapse. And they wanted to invite me as a government scientist down to work with the community to determine what occurred. Now, eiders, I consider them seabirds because they spend so much time at sea, they only lay their eggs coming on land to island, small islands. So they're social and very gregarious and Inuit and people in Newfoundland, Atlantic Canada and West Greenland harvest them for meat, eggs and feather down. So Inuit hunters, and this is my early lessons, they knew a lot about eider ecology, much more than I did. And so I flew down there, I had to go Yellowknife, Calgary, Calgary, Montreal, Montreal all up through Quebec, then out to the archipelago. It took me three days to get into the community. What had occurred was the Pinotubo volcanic eruption what occurred in the Philippines on the other side of the world a year earlier. Now the, the ash plume, this was the second largest volcanic eruption in a hundred years. And the ash plume is 40 kilometers across the diameter here. It was so massive that this is a picture taken from the, the International Space Station. And it generated so much ash into the atmosphere, this gray line, that reflected the solar radiation into the atmosphere back out into space. And the planet cooled for two years. And this had implications on sea ice in the cryosphere in the circumpolar Arctic the following year. Now the Inuit didn't know about the Pinotubo volcanic eruption. They just knew that there'd been an extreme winter which froze up the polynias and the open water areas the eiders needed 
And so they had regional experience, but not yet a global perspective. And by combining our, our approaches, we came up with the answer of what had occurred. Now, eiders in the Belt Shore Islands of Hudson Bay, they're one of the only seabirds that spends the entire winter in the Arctic. And the reason they do is the strong currents between the islands keep the ocean open. And so there are areas, polynias, these open areas that can support 150,000 eiders in one place. And when they take off in the morning, it sounds like a, ro it sounds like a rocket taking off. A polynia. It's a Russian word, and it means pond. And it's... It's 35 below zero Celsius in this photo. So if there is no current, the sea would freeze over. In fact, when the tide ebbs, you can actually watch the ice form. And then when the current shifts, the ice breaks up again. But at extreme cold temperatures, some of these foraging areas would freeze over and the birds would uh, effectively die of starvation and freeze to death. And the Inuit were in, on the ice detecting this population collapse, not Western scientists. In the years to come, we collaborated with the community. We set up observation blinds on the edge of these polynias, and we could study birds on the surface, their foraging ecology. We're in blinds to get out of the wind, and we'd have a Coleman stove inside to keep us warm. And so the only difference between this box and your home freezer is your home freezer is warmer inside because we could only get the temperature up to about minus 25, which is colder than your, than your uh, freezer. But absolutely beautiful. And we advanced the work and we dropped video cameras and videography below the ice and could film the birds feeding on the seafloor in relation to tidal currents. This has actually been featured in the BBC Living Planet series um, because once the BBC photographers saw what we were doing, uh, we, they joined us and we guided them out on the ice. But Joel Heath was a PhD student um, very, very talented, multi-talented person. And he was able to turn this videography into data to look at how their foraging ecology changed with currents, to look at how resilient these birds were to tidal currents and ice conditions. When, and what happened was these birds have such short day length and such strong currents that they have to forage in. They're very finely tuned because the currents are so strong at the strongest velocities, they actually can't get to the bottom without being swept under the ice to their death. So they have to time the currents. And on the surface, this is a picture of about minus 35 with a 50 kilometer wind, which is about minus 75 degrees Celsius. I learned that you can't wear rings during this field work because of the conductivity, you'll get frostbite. I learned that the hard way. And I'm just gonna explain, this is from Joel's thesis. This is the foraging activity of the birds and this and this is the tidal currents so this is very high currents and very low currents now what we thought would happen is the birds should be foraging when the currents are the least but what they did instead is they they would jump into the polynia when there was still current feed aggressively they'd fill up of mussels and urchins and then they'd be digesting the invertebrates because there's a digestive rate capacity because they're muscles. And then by the time they're empty, they hop and they dive to the bottom and they fill up again the second time. And then they jump out onto the ice while the currents are strongest. So what the birds are doing is they're, by adjusting the current, adapting to the current, they're feeding twice per tidal cycle, not just once. And that made all the difference. The point here is the things such as tidal currents, the cryosphere of snow and ice, and the behavioral ecology of birds are all integrated in a very extreme environment. And the Inuit were there to watch when the ecosystem was changing due to a factor they knew nothing about but were able to detect. It also was exciting to go to one of the most extreme field experiences in my career and publish science that was actually taken up uh, broadly um, looking at some of the abiotic factors affecting seabird diving. This is 3,500 eiders, just in an open water area taken from a plane. The white birds are males and the brown birds are females and juveniles. 
And so Joel was even able to turn the video into mathematics and he did a postdoc at UBC looking at social interactions much as starlings fly in air or schooling fish behave. So the take home message there is listen to people that are out on the land. In my case, it's Inuit. Down here, it might be farmers or agricultural sector. And be open to hearing information from sources beyond Western science. But also know that Western science has techniques and approaches that are often complementary. And together, you can link global patterns with regional implications. So now I'm going to move to another topic, which is one of the reasons I was originally hired by Environment Canada, was the Northern Common Eider was considered to be in decline in Nunavut. Now, the thing with migratory birds is they're migratory and they often cross international boundaries beyond and outside of Canada. And in terms of seabirds, unfortunately for me, they don't go to Florida or Chincoteague or Mexico or Argentina. They go to places like Greenland and Newfoundland in the winter or they're far off shore. So I don't get any winter trips like my shorebird colleagues, but I'm not resentful. Here is a photograph of an Inuit hunter with no life jacket in a homemade rowboat off the coast of Greenland with a flock of eiders, and they're heavily harvested in Greenland. Again, they're wonderful to eat. Newfoundlanders um, hunt them aggressively as well and in places like the North Shore of Quebec. And when it comes to harvest management for people and communities in Nunavut, this is not recreational harvest like waterfowl hunters down here. It has real implications for what we call food security. Many of the meals uh, for Inuit, especially in remote communities, are wild game, including eiders. And in recent, and it's shocking, but consider that pregnant women, even as late as 2010, wouldn't necessarily have three meals a day, not even two meals a day. They're often eating only once a day. And some of those meals would be eiders, caribou, fish, and so on. So when we're talking about harvest management and co-management of wildlife, it has direct implications to people's health and well-being in the north. There was evidence that the Canadian breeding birds would migrate to winter off the coast of Greenland that's strongly affected by the Gulf Stream. So even though it might be 20 or 30 below zero, the ocean is warm enough to support open water that supported the birds. And also there's a, um, my collaborator in Denmark, Fleming Merkel, there was an 80% decline in the breeding population in West Greenland. And there's also discussion in Canada that the breeding population had also been in decline. Consider that even a hundred years ago, biologists recognized that because eiders are so big and fat that they're crippled. So if you shoot into a flock of eiders, you might kill one, but you're gonna wound three. And so it's called crippling loss. And you have to factor that in as well. So it's not just a hunter coming back with 10 birds. If they're careless, there might be 10 or 20 other birds left crippled, not retrieved and die later. So let's look at modern rates of embedded shot and eiders. Well, how do you do that? Well, you take over the airport in Newt Greenland and you send eider ducks through the airport security system in the middle of the night. So this is our sampling design and it's very effective. Yeah, now I'm not sure you could do that these days. This is before 9-11, like I'm dating myself, but we had a blast. So you get all, you go to the hunters, you get birds and these birds are collected. They're, they're it's a bycatch, they're killed in nets. So these birds haven't been shot. They've been drowned in nets and now we're putting them through the airport security and 30, to 40% of birds had embedded shot in them, which is just an index of their hunting pressure, meaning birds have been shot once and some of the birds have been shot twice to survive. So what we needed to do was Denmark and the Canadian team and the Greenland team, we needed to quantify the linkages between Canada, Greenland and Atlantic Canada. So we have 400,000 breeding birds in Canada, but where do they spend the winter? Because the hunting pressure in Atlantic Canada and Greenland is different. So we needed a location to start putting bands on birds, start generating a research program. And this is East Bay, the East Bay Migratory Bird Sanctuary in June. So when everyone down here is barbecuing and cutting grass, we're up there still in the snow and the sea ice. There's an island that's only 800 meters long and this was the, long, the largest eider colony in Canada, Arctic Canada. 
And over the years, we've set up infrastructure, including cabins, a kitchen cabin, and increasingly we have an electric bear fence because of the polar bear risk. But this actually provided a foundation for graduate students and honor students, uh, several of whom uh, went to Trent and other universities from across Canada. So I already thank the field crews, which is a mix of Inuit grad students, contractors, and university professors. The birds leave the flow edge at 2 a.m. and they arrive to the island when they're prospecting about 3 a.m. So we're getting up early at dawn and we catch the birds in these big flight nets. So it's like a mist net and we're catching the birds as they fly around the island prospecting for nest sites. And then we put on these colored Darvik bands so we can keep track of the bird through its entire life, not just if it's hunted, but when it comes back. So we get a sense of age, behavior and reproductive success. And the females also get a temporary nasal combination called nasal tags. This enables us to find them again once we release them because when they're sitting on their leg, eggs, you can't see their legs or their bands. They all look the same. They're all just brown and camouflaged. So then we release them as we catch them. It's actually great fun. And here's a female being released. And the nasal tags drop off as the summer goes on so they don't migrate with them. And then we work from blinds like this so we can observe where the birds are on the island. Immediately we realize that 60% of the returns are coming from Greenland and the 40% from Atlantic Canada, but understand that the, there's a factor in here called band reporting. Like what proportion, if you're a hunter and you don't like the government, are you gonna report the bands, right? It turns out government biologists are equally disliked in both countries. So the banding reporting rate was actually equivalent. But we wanted to get more detailed and so we, uh, we embraced new technology at the time. It was called satellite tracking. And so we worked with veterinarians from Denmark who came across to Canada and we set up a surgical tent and a canvas prospector tent heated by a Coleman stove. We implanted satellite transmitters and released the birds to the wild and were able to track them in real time through the Arctic. So it was really fun to go to my office and every Monday morning see where the birds were as they're moving through. That's one of my kids looking for me. <laughs> so here's the type of data we get. It's very detailed. And this shows that again, the linkages between Canadian birds on Southampton Island, um, going to West Greenland to spend the winter, but also important areas in Labrador. And these birds are being hunted all the way, including the North Shore of Quebec. So just to summarize, we have birds that are in Canada where we're banding. And they have two wintering areas, one in Southwest Greenland and one in Atlantic Canada. We have birds that breed in Greenland, but they never came across to Canada. So that's a Greenland population. And when we integrated this in a demographic model, linking how many birds are out there in the wild with how many birds are hunted and killed, we could clearly see that the Greenland population wasn't sustainable, it was in decline. And similarly, the, even the birds in Canada were at risk um, because of potential overharvest. One of the reasons was the hunt in Greenland really didn't have any restrictions. There was no bag limit and there was hardly any seasonal restrictions. So it was like free game, basically. Like cause you could go out, if the weather was good enough and you can go out shoot birds, fill your boots. There's, there's no limits. And that, because these birds don't, are, are long lived and don't reproduce a lot like mallards do, this can have strong implications and the population seem to be in decline. So we worked with the Danish government and Inuit hunters. We brought Canadian Inuit, and flew them to Greenland to meet and work with Greenlandic Inuit, just to emphasize the point that it was a shared population. And if it was going to continue along these lines, hunting wasn't sustainable and that's something no one wanted. So collectively, we extend the closed season, especially towards the end of the winter which en enabled more females to survive the winter and come back to breed. Simple, but it's all based on math, computer modeling. And again, here we brought in experts to work on the demography of this. So we extended the closed season. So it was a major change in Greenland hunters and would the colonies show signs of recovery? We set up community-based monitoring in West Greenland, meaning Inuit would go survey the colonies close to them 
and we continued to monitor colonies in Canada. So interestingly, with the change in regulations in 2001 and 2002, both the Greenland and Canadian populations immediately restarted to recover. It was really dramatic. It's probably one of the most exciting achievements of our team, especially when we overlay the harvest regulations. So this is rates of harvest and you can see it really dropped off in 2002 and the population really started to recover. So our colony, for example, at East Bay went from 2,000 to 3,000 females to 8,000 females in only six years. And also when you consider those females survive and they reproduce and their young survive and reproduce, it goes exponential because we've taken off the limiting factor. So just when we thought in a sense, our work was done and I was gonna shift priorities onto another species or another conservation issue, we had a dramatic population mortality event at East Bay Island in Hudson Bay. And this is an avian disease, which was confirmed as avian cholera. And it killed about 30% of our breeding population in about 10 days. So now I'm gonna discuss a little bit about this disease epidemic. Now, what is avian cholera? I actually didn't take disease and stuff at Trent because I didn't think it was necessary because I work in the Arctic and you don't hear a lot about avian influenza and cholera. That's what happens to waterfowl in Utah and the prairies when you have all these waterfowl crammed into a re reserve, for example. But there is a history of avian cholera. It seemed to jump from poultry that had been brought from Europe into the wild waterfowl population in North America. It was first detected in Texas during the Second World War and it spread through the flyways. And there was a different serotypes. And there's this Eastern Atlantic serotype. And it entered into the eider populations first detected in Maine, then the St. Lawrence River, and then up with us in 2004 in Northern Quebec, and then the Angava Peninsula, and then East Bay where I work. So in a sense, this disease is migrating with the birds. And this population had never experienced cholera before, so that's why it was particularly deadly. We wanted to know if this was just a recent event or whether it had occurred previously in the last century. You know, you have to be there as a scientist to detect a change, right? But if we're absent, what can you say about the past? So what we did is we enlisted Dominique Henri, who's a social scientist, and she did a part of her PhD on interviewing community members about their um, their oral history, oral uh, information about eiders that they know a lot about. And it turns out that they had no recollection or no oral history about massive eider declines or these mass die-off events. And that it was first detected in 2004 by them and then by us. So all this to say, the Inuit communities in Southern, um, Southern Arctic, Northern Quebec and South Baffin Island had no previous history with cholera until it arrived. But interestingly, there was a story of a lightning strike that hit an island and executed, electrocuted all the birds. And uh, that was in 1964 in July. And I, like, how do people know that? It's like, well, that's the year I got married. And, you know, so it was, it was very detailed information, but there was no history about cholera. This is an interesting photograph because it's the juxtaposition between Facebook and, you know, caribou being butchered in the living room. And this is one of the fun and, and rich aspects of working in none of it, because there's so many dimensions to it. So we're already present on the island because we're working on harvest dynamics, right? So we're already set up with banding protocols, blinds, nasal type females, even the herring gulls are banded. And each year we would count how many birds died. Cholera actually changes the behavior of the host organism so as they're getting sick, they actually get thirsty and they move to fresh water sources like this to drink and they die. And then the bacteria leaves the corpse and sits on the meniscus of the water waiting for the next host to come. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. So like Omicron, it doesn't really phase me. But yeah. So here, this, this is just to show you the power of a long-term study that initially started by hunt, for hunting issues. So we regulated the hunt and then the population starts to grow, right? You know about that. Then cholera emerges and we have a big mass die-off event 2006. And then there's 
Oh, another wave, right? Now you know what waves are about. So there's uh, two waves, and now it's dampened out. Because the birds have antibodies. The birds that survived now have antibodies. And so this is a female survival rate based on year. You can see the dramatic effects of cholera juxtaposed. Now, had we not been there, all you would get is a pile of dead ducks, right? You really wouldn't be able to interpret what was going on. And so this gave us an opportunity. We were in the site before the epidemic, during it, and after it. And so it was a tremendous research opportunity. So we applied to NSERC to get a special research grant to bring in more collaborators and more students to study this. We also worked with Health Canada because at the same time, there's an avian influenza outbreak in China and Inuit were getting it mixed up. They were, they were are eiders safe to eat? Is this avian influenza? Uh, CBC National News is confusing us. So we worked with Health Canada, put out newsletters, and we did community reporting to try to just let them know that avian cholera cannot jump to humans, and that it's so deadly and so quickly lethal that if you shoot a healthy duck, the likelihood of even having cholera is almost nil. So it's interesting sometimes when you're a biologist to work with Health Canada and the, po and the public on issues that are relevant. Now here is where the NSERC grant and bringing in new students gave us uh, some more opportunities. We found that the probability of a female dying on the island increased the more eggs she laid. And what happened here is two things could be going on here. One is older females lay larger clutches. They arrive to the colony the earliest and are therefore exposed to the disease the longest. Another thing is females that are investing a lot of themselves literally in the clutch are, uh, that could affect their immunity or their response to disease and make them more vulnerable. And we can't discern which is which, but it is interesting that the older, more experienced, most reproductively active females were the most likely to die during the, the epidemic. So being a poor breeder actually increased your probability of surviving. When we banned, we hold birds sometimes for different durations and we keep track of it. And one of our grad students looked into this and said that the, during the pandemic, the epidemic of the disease, the longer a bird was held under stress, the more likely it would die. But this pattern only held during the pandemic. Under normal circumstances, we don't detect, detect this. So it seems like even if you're holding a bird in cut during handling, like wildlife handling, even if the stress, we can't detect it, it had implications during a disease outbreak. And so then we adjusted our methods and we now only hold birds for an hour. And if they haven't been processed, they're released. And this, we wrote this up in journal wildlife management because it had implications for animal care and, and handling of birds. So we looked at the temporal dynamics. It was rare in the Arctic, but now it's present. The epidemic didn't influence by nesting density but really the timing of when birds arrived at the colony. Handling stress lowered long-term fitness of individuals and it increased mortality and delayed egg laying, but only during the epidemic itself. The females that laid large clutches were more likely to succumb to the disease. We're actually looking at this now with our collaborator, Vicki Friesen at Queens. So we took all these blood samples and she's actually looking for this selective sweep that this mortality event occurred and whether the genetics of the population after the epidemic are different than the prior to the epidemic. So we have a PhD student working on that now. So very good question. So now we've talked harvest, disease, volcanic eruptions, now it gets really complicated and particularly dangerous. So when I see people swimming with great white sharks, that's not nearly as dangerous as handling bears because bears are smarter. They're inquisitive, they're curious, and they're more individualistic in their approach. Now we've seen this figure, we're talking about global change. And I wanna take you in a sense behind the scenes about what a figure like this, its implications to ecosystems in the Arctic. And this is just one case study of many. 
So the Arctic, especially in the Eastern Arctic is warming. This is real data. And this is the ice season length in one of the regions where Eric and I work. So this is Northern Quebec, Northern Hudson Bay, Southampton Island. And this is the ice area that this data represents. The Canadian Ice Service breaks up the Arctic into areas. The length of the ice, ice season length means that over time there's more open water. The ice period is shorter. And since like I graduated from graduate school, it's declined by more than a month and a half, which has strong implications for ice associated species like bears. So I'm studying birds, but I had to learn a lot about bears. And it turns out the bears, the best season for energy intake is late winter when seal pups are on the ice. They're vulnerable, they're easy to find. And the snow is, makes the, the bears, they can travel easily on the ice. And it's just like a gluttonous feast of seal. The bears put on a lot of fat and then they head into the summer they, once the ice breaks up and they have to fast. So the summer for a bear is the worst time of year. So if you extend that hot period where they can't really eat, it has strong implications on them. Now, our long-term study, this is two photographs taken in camp on the same day of the year, just to give you a visual of the environmental variation. Dr. Oliver Love from U Windsor, he came and joined our team at 2006. And he thought, man, this is great. No snow, no shoveling. And then the next year, ha, here's your shovel, get digging. But what this does is it gives us variation in our long-term studies. Coates Island is the bottom figure and East Bay Island. And in our camps, every day we write what we do, what we've achieved, and also whether we've encountered bears or not. And so this is showing the bear encounter days over time. So when I started East Bay, the red figure in the late 1990s, we slept in dome tents. Now we sleep in cabins surrounded by a 13,000 volt electric fence because there's so many bears. So there's been a tipping point in bear activity that's being driven by the sea ice going out in the coastal areas around us. Now we're looking at the number of bear days in relation to sea ice concentration. And simply put, we see more bears on the Eider Island during years with early ice melt. There's this tipping point. Once the ice is half, it gets into the slushy mix, the seals have the advantage and bears have to swim on land. And the first thing they encounter are eider duck colonies and bears are like, they're very opportunistic. And so they remain on the colonies and eat eggs. This was one of the first examples of the changing climate impacting the cryosphere and impacting ecosystem and interspecific interactions, especially predator prey reaction interactions. So this is um, a female and her cub and a male taken from within the fence. We're often outnumbered now by bears and in the distance is the mainland and that's where Erica works. And there's another shorebird camp there. Interestingly, these changes were detected in um, Svalbard and other parts in the, in the circumpolar Arctic. The number of, so other teams saw this paper and they also looked into their own information and this is the bear interactions in their camps over time. So it's an issue throughout the circumpolar Arctic. Cody Day joined the team and he looked at the interactions of how climate change is impacting eider duck ecology, especially in terms of population size. So the more bears there are, the less we build up to success and eider populations are gonna decline. But because of earlier springs and longer breeding seasons, the, uh, the number of birds surviving and being able to breed are increasing. So climate change and environmental issues don't always generate negative implications. What Cody's doing is he's looking at the bear implications and the timing of breeding and the clutch size, which is going up and finding that at the moment, it's kind of creating a neutral population effect. Now this is all mainly done at one island. And of course, as an ecologist, you wanna look at the landscape and how broad are these things. So East Bay gives us a field site where we can look at detailed interactions between bears and eiders and so on. But we wanted to get out there on the landscape. And we did this by going in, uh, tapping into Inuit communities and Inuit field assistants 
in doing coastal surveys by freighter canoe. This photograph is taken in July and Jennifer Proventure, who you'll meet in the next lecture, participated in these surveys as well. So these are our two long-term studies, Southampton and Coates, and all the black dots are eider duck colonies visited by our field teams. Most of the people on the cruise were Inuit from the local communities. This is one of the most extensive coastal seabird surveys in the circumpolar Arctic, and it's all done out of freighter canoes. I'm gonna take a moment here because this is the eider colony size and how things are starting to change. Bears are most disruptive to the large eider colonies where there's a lot of birds in one tight location. And when birds are distributed on small islands, it takes bears more time and more effort to reach them. So bears mainland distance is where the island is in relation to Baffin Island. And bears are coming out of the islands from the ocean, not the land. So the first islands they come to are the ones furthest offshore. Before, the biggest predator risk was foxes coming from the mainland. But now with changing ice dynamics, the biggest predator issue is now polar bears coming from the sea. And we'd expect the biggest colonies originally were very far offshore, away from foxes. But now we're starting to see that the change in colony size over the next uh, last 20 years is shifting. So the blue is birds moving away from those offshore big colonies and moving towards the coast away from the bears. And some of the colonies that are growing the most are near Inuit communities where there's a bear free zone. So we're already starting to see the shift in either distribution in response to the increased predator pressure of bears and that eiders are starting to disperse from a few large colonies to more smaller colonies which make it more time consuming for bears to make their rounds in a sense swimming from one island to the next. Now when I first started working with eider ducks there's so many hundreds of small rocky islands in the Canadian Arctic and West Greenland that I thought habitat was never limiting for this bird, that they could just move from one island to the next. But I was wrong because I wasn't thinking carefully enough and I hadn't been to enough islands to see the differences among them. A key difference is some islands, because these are recently glaciated, right? They've only been free of glaciation for the last 10,000 years or so, which is biologically and geographically recent. And in these island archipelagos, some are bald rock and some have moss and peat. And we started to think that the birds were actually changing the ecosystems through their nutrient input brought from the sea. And those large colonies that have been established for hundreds of years, the more we're starting to think that the, the moss, which would retain water and fresh water for the birds to drink, they're actually changing the ecosystem and the island environment to, to improve their nesting habitat, which would then attract more birds over time. So Nick Clyde surveyed a lot of these islands and he did a lot of sampling of soil, peat and water chemistry. And he found this is active nests. So from 10 pairs to 400 pairs and percent cover is the plant cover. So there's a strong relationship between vegetated islands and colony size, controlling for where the island is in relation to the coast and how big the surface area of the islands were because there were so many islands we could control for those things. And that's one of the pleasures of working with islands. They're very discreet. And unlike fields or the jungle, they're very discreet and it really lends itself to scientific inquiry. Soil depth, again, increased so the more and the larger and active the colony, the more vegetation and the deeper the depth of the soil. And that has strong applications because the soil is made up of peat and sphagnum moss, which retains water. And so one of the biggest challenges for a nesting eider duck is it has to sit on the nest for 21 to 24 days without leaving. If it leaves, the eggs get stolen by herring gulls. And so they really want to avoid having to leave the nest to take a drink. So they nest near ponds, and sometimes their trips to have a drink are only a few minutes at a time. So they get off the nest, they conceal their eggs, they run and take a drink, and they run back to the nest, and they hop back on. 
And so fresh water is a really big deal for common eiders. And the deeper the peat, the more the ponds retain water over the course of the summertime. The other thing is the nutrients and the nitrogen brought by the birds through their droppings is, has to be brought every year because the rain can wash it away and the winters can wash it away. So an active colony has very recent nitrogen inputs and a really rich moss and plant community. And remember, bears are disrupting all of this because of the timing of ice is changing and the bears are coming out of the islands. So you can see the vegetation around the pond edge, that's all driven by hundreds of years of nutrient input from ducks. So here's the positive feedback mechanisms all based on the published manuscripts and the lab chemistry. So you have eiders arrive and they might be attracted to an island because it has a pond in the first place that they can land on. They bring nutrients from the sea with their droppings and their feathers and their eggshells and the detritus of a colony. The nutrients help contribute to the development of soil and plants. As that builds up, more nutrients are retained and the soil starts to build up even more. The soil and the pond edges contribute to the ponds getting deeper, which in turn has a positive attractive principle to bring more eiders to the colony. And so it generates this positive feedback mechanism. When you multiply by centuries, changes the ecosystem of the islands. Now here's something that got, this is one of those scientific opportunities when you get approached, this is Catherine Hargan. She was in a lab and she is a paleobotanist. And what she did is she took sediment cores of the ponds and looked at the nutrient influences of those ponds going back to the 1600s. So remember the nutrients are coming from birds. And one thing that she discovered is there is this dramatic decline in nutrient inputs, particularly after 1900 on many of these islands in the Hudson Strait. And I said, well, that makes sense. The population is collapsing around 1900 because the advent of rifles, shotguns, and boats in Greenland. So they're going from shooting birds out of kayaks to motorboats and, and firearms. And so when we overlay the increase of harvest pressure on the nutrient response and then breeding colonies in Canada, there's this relationship. So that, in, that is an index to show, you can see when the Canadian breeding population was being hammered by the advent of this tremendous growth in harvest in Greenland. And all of that is sitting in pond sediments, that information. So we're even able to do retrospective ecological inquiry based on new laboratory techniques by collaborating with other labs. Which brings us back to that harvest issue I started the talk with, so it's still ongoing. So I'm just ending now. These red dots are our fixed field stations. These are cabins and bear fences and some basic infrastructure. Now, many of our cabins would appear to you like they're like a garden shed where you put your wheelbarrow and your rake in your backyard. But when it's blowing 120 kilometers an hour and there's wet snow, it's really comfortable to get into a cabin. As well, I started off sleeping in tents because it's kind of exciting. But if you're spending so much of your time trying to stay warm and dry, you're, you're losing your energy and your stamina that you could devote to field work. So when we put these cabins in place, people were safer. They had more stamina, they had more sense of humor, and it really generated an upsurge in productivity. And then it also attracted other collaborators, collaborators because the professor doesn't want to send their students into dangerous environments where they're poorly supported. These are important things, whether you're working in the jungles of India on fish or the Arctic or points in between. A lot of this science, because it has implications for climate change and changing ecosystems, has been featured in things such as the Arctic Council's, Council's Arctic Biodiversity Assessment. Sometimes I'm asked, like, what does all this do? Where does it all go? And does it all matter, any of it? And so this is circumpolar scientists from many different disciplines converging our findings in one document, and then there'd be a synthesis document for the press to make it easily accessible to the public. And these have had uh, strong implications and it's rewarding to be a part of it. We also, before the pandemic, would meet in person 
And some of these studies on eiders, because they're circumpolar species, we could repeat these studies in other locations. I remember Erica, when I started working on eiders, she said, oh, I wouldn't work on eiders. Everyone's working on eiders. Like there's competition and how can you do it? And that's true. But the but is because everyone's working on eiders in Norway and Russia and Iceland, then you can integrate data sets and you can see and compare my birds migrate, the birds in Iceland do not. What implications do those types of things have? We also you know, wrote up papers looking at circumpolar reviews of seabirds that never could have been done. And actually the internet really helped with this uh, because it enabled us to collaborate more than we could in the days of faxes and uh, so on. So just to end, this is Lucas E. Ipak. He's a friend of mine and he was one of the key field assistants and team leaders in the winter work in the Belcher Islands. You know, the ratio of field staff was four Inuit to one Western Southern based scientist. And he joked that his job was to keep me alive for the field work. And he'd often say, you warm enough, you know? And uh, when I first went up, I wore a snow goose parka, you know, the really expensive ones. And I froze because it had pockets and zippers which would fill with snow and the cold would penetrate. And so as the field work went on, all the field crew would wear these eider down parkas. And in one of our research grants, we got the money to have seamstresses in the community make us parkas so that all the field crew could be completely decked out in eider down. Now, Lucas C. had rarely left Santa Kilowack in his lifetime. He's my age. He'd been out of the community perhaps four times and only to Winnipeg for health reasons or to accompany his wife for delivery of her baby or something. And so I had the opportunity to invite him to join us at an ArcticNet conference in Quebec. ArcticNet is an NSERC research program, multidisciplinary, that studies, many people at Trent are involved with this. It's social housing, health, ecology, snow and ice research. And so I thought Luke would be really excited to come to a conference that was entirely dedicated to the Arctic and the issues particularly facing Inuit. So I asked him as we sat in the chateau in Quebec City, what do you think of this conference? Like, isn't it, it's cool. And he said, oh, well, every room I go into, there's a scientist at the front talking. All you do is talk. You should talk less and you should do more. So he was quietly moving from room to room. The scientists are all excited by our discoveries and our contributions, but the people, some of whom that we're working towards to help support, in my case, sustainable harvest, wildlife co-management and so on, were less than impressed because they weren't seeing as much action. So that is maybe a take home message a message I first heard at Trent because of the multidisciplinary of the school and its interest in the North. And um, I really appreciate his coming, as you can imagine, coming full circle to come back maybe 30 years later and give a lecture on some of the things we've been working on since, but also to see how the multidisciplinarity of Trent, geography, indigenous studies, art history, and the different sciences. Um, I hope you can see some of the themes running through a science program in the North. So thanks very much for coming and I really appreciate the invitation to give this lecture.